Hi, everyone. Hello, Alexander, Richard, Hugo. Everyone doing okay? Yields are giving up a little ground today, almost making that look like a false breakout. But I just think that this move is just too strong for it to abort that, you know, that this line is, you know, uh, not a breakout line. So I still think that we're going to flag here, consolidate the straight line move and head higher. Maybe we could get back to these previous levels, 132 or so. So what impact did it have higher yields about two days worth of higher yields uh, really cracked the gold. Okay, so the gold sitting on, on top of this support level again, and with the yields coming off, maybe it'll bounce, but I'd say the greatest impact was felt in the gold market, not as much in silver. Hi, Orion. Uh, silver looks better to me than gold. Look how much deeper this was than silver. And silver still has a confirmed high up here, whereas uh, gold does as well. But I think there's lower levels. Maybe look at something like uh, 1810, 1814 for another break. I don't think that's going to be it. The dollar, a decent rally off higher yields, uh, 60 pips. You know, if we didn't have the holiday off, uh, this would be a turnaround Tuesday. I'm still not convinced this is the low in the dollar. So uh, looking for another selling opportunity in uh, the Dixie, another buying opportunity that might be setting up right here in the Euro. Uh, yen, despite yields being down, trying to hold. Yeah, it's been difficult to get follow through. So um, I still think there's a chance that we head up towards this high, towards 112. Back under these lows of uh, 109 and a half, I'd be out of any kind of longs here. Uh, the S&Ps felt the pressure of yields yesterday. Uh, we had a decent two-day break, uh, day and a half break from almost new highs to 4,500. S&Ps are acting heavy, whereas the NASDAQ still um, really carrying the whole market. Crypto crack, that's true. We talked about that yesterday, about that the potential of uh, this being the end of the rally up here at 52,000. Uh, look at what it's holding. Is it gonna hold it and rally to new highs? I don't think so. So what was it? El Salvador that is making crypto uh, a national currency. So I, I'd say this is the first real good beta test for trying to use beta, uh, trying to use Bitcoin as a currency uh, for everyone. Uh, let's see how it goes in El Salvador. I heard that the Sandinistas came in and switched all the Bitcoin that the populace was going to get and uh, exchanged it for uh, doggy coin. Sansi, a good retrace lower. Okay, thank you, Sansi. Sansi's a very good trader. I've watched his uh, commentary over the years. So when he has an opinion, one another good reason to be here and face. We have some very educated traders in here, but you know what? If you like Sansi's comments, you're really gonna like the action in our in our members chat because that goes on all day and evening throughout all the different sessions. So you'll never be alone in there. Okay, and uh, recommend that you guys sign up. Uh, big believer in communities. I think you'll trade better in a community than you will on your own. You'll you'll get more ideas. You'll see more methodologies, more techniques. Um, I do also believe that people in there want to help you. You could reach out. Never know, someone might take you under their wing. 
that's how a lot of people learn how to trade is that someone reaches out to show them how they do it. And you may pick up some uh, pearls that you could implement in your own trading strategy. So uh, consider this, at least try the trial for a buck and uh, check it out. Okay, Richard's a fan of uh, Ryan. Ryan's very good. In fact, that's a great segue. How are you this morning, Ryan? Yeah, hi, around? Dale. Yeah, I'm here, mate. How are you, mate? Okay, pretty good. So uh, Richard's been with you for a while, right? Uh, it seems Ann? to me, yeah. He's always, always uh, been in tune with what we've been doing since we come over. And uh, thank you very much, okay. Richard. Uh, checks in the post. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. So, uh, you know, kind of a quiet day today compared to yesterday um anything that uh you see i mean yields uh, did not hold that pretty important level no um, that's right what did we say what did we say yesterday we said you know you suddenly get a move it looks like it's all going your way and then wallop you get a fake yeah. break and it all turn you wake up next morning and, and it's completely turned around yeah um, so you know. I, I i mean i can't call that a breakout uh anymore because it really didn't. It meant something in her day, but not today. Maybe a false breakout, I could call it. Yeah. So yeah, a lot the of. The only thing is, we, we've just yeah, but we've just we've just nicked a a, a fresher high, um, and that okay. to me is a, is a signal in itself. It just shows that perhaps the top is starting to crack a bit more. Okay. Uh, rather than being the solid wall it is, um, but it hasn't made much difference to uh, dollar pairs today, and we we saw a bit of yen buying coming in. This morning, and, and that's kept the majors under pressure, like cable and euro dollar. Um, we've seen those down now, euro dollar down towards 118.10. Um, yes. I've been slicing my short off as we go. I was, I should have probably done something at 13, but um, I wanted to try for 05s. But then, you know, okay. as we say, we've got to look at the levels, and if we are to turn around the turnaround, if you like, we've got to get back above this 1830 level, then back above the 5060 level. If we don't do that, it keeps the bearish pressure in play and, and, you know, then perhaps we get a test of 1800, um, get above sort of 185060 and eyes are back on 1880 and 1900 again. Yeah. If it doesn't dig its heels in here, Ryan, uh, it almost looks like it could pull back to this pivot has been, you know, there, um, uh, both sides of the pivot usually get some kind of follow through at 17 and a half and would kind of have a look of a, head and shoulders type of formation down here at this 17 and a half level if the dollar decides to continue to be firm for a bit longer. Yeah, exactly. Um, I was, I was yeah. saying this morning in the room, we need to we need to get through 1790, probably 1780 to confirm, a, you know, the next shove down to that 1750 level. Okay. And uh, the commodity currencies gave some back, but uh, I don't think they're over yet either i think uh we could still maybe see this is a pretty big area right up here where the 50 day is 75 30 and then uh, you know 76 all the way up here i'm not sure if we're going to be able to get up to 76 but um if the dollar is still going to fail one more time and head down towards 91 that could happen um any feeling on what you saw in precious metals yesterday pretty good whack and gold um yeah you know down to the levels again you know we look we've been looking at that around that area that sort of 1800 1790 area for for a long while you know i've got the line in there as you say you know yeah. if you want to trade it simple terms there's your level you try longs keep it tight and if it goes against you then you, you reverse it um you know, it's it's one thing looking at moves and seeing the same old thing day in day out and seeing these reversals and yeah. you know fake moves they're still producing the levels and um, that's what we've got to look at. And that's how you got to trade. You ever notice that at times um, you'll see one formation become predominant in a lot of different um, instruments. And, you know, we just talked about the uh, potential of, you know, if we went to 1750 in Euro, uh, that would form a right shoulder. Well, if we went to 1750 ish in the gold here, um, that could be a right shoulder. So, what I mean, the neckline's clearly def uh, defined. So, I mean, if we, we didn't get a breakout here, they just looks like they went on a little stop hunt. But next time through 1830, um, it would measure 1960. So, yeah. from this low. So, you know, 
uh, things were turned back right where they were going to break out. So, you know, we uh, turned the gold back and now we're turning the euro back and we'll see if there's just another few days follow through. That's going to be the test of uh, uh, to see if the dollar can sell off again. So uh, yeah, that's about obviously. all I see. And the S&P took a pretty good hit yesterday and uh, they're following through today. Um, you know, rounding top here, um, you know, 4,500, 4,400. I, I don't know why we can't do this. So uh, starting, I would pay attention to this. Uh, Ryan, I, I was taught this a long time ago, such a simple method. Uh, uh, in fact, I learned it from a guy who wrote a newsletter out of Naperville, Eric Hadick, and um, he uses two week reversals. Um, yeah. Of course, you, you don't know if you're going to have a reversal till Friday, but we're within striking distance. In fact, we traded underneath it under 4511 by Friday would be a two week reversal in S&Ps. So yeah. just, yeah. you know, that'd be the so first one in a while. So, so let me ask you this, Dale, you know, because we're, we're seeing a bit of weakness in stocks the last couple of days. And, and that's following the run up in yields that we got post NFP. Is, is that the market perhaps now really getting into the taper thing as far as stocks are concerned? Because, you know, yields pretty much ignored the bad NFP. Um, and that was a standout thing we, we highlighted on Friday. Um, so is, is our stocks now perhaps taking a, a bit of a notice? You know, if we get a, a day to day of, of losses, is that going to start setting a trend into the taper? Um, I've always heard that it takes a spike in rates uh, for, you know, bonds usually uh, lead the way for a correction and then they they rally big when the correction starts in equities. And, uh, you know, yeah. I, I don't know why they wouldn't take notice of rates um, because, you know, this was not much of a, with all the bond buying and everything that goes on by the Fed, this was not much of a rally um in tlt so yeah. yeah i would say if we start taking out this 139 fed will keep buying everything but for if they're buying everything forex scale my question is if they're a bond buyer why aren't the bonds 162 instead of here at 146 and basically they broke down here and they're just testing a breakdown so yeah uh whatever the fed is doing is it's not effective there um uh, you know, what's interesting and, you know, I look at these two things and I want to get the rest of the crew in is that people are buying junk, high yield bonds because you get a higher yield. But look at that compared to investment grade corporates. And when you talk about investment grade corporates, uh, that's, you know, the equities that you trade um, much weaker structure in investment grade something compared to junk everything. So, um, you know, uh, and the guest we had on yesterday said that the uh, not so much each market, but the credit spreads between them um, started to widen out uh, a couple of weeks ago when we had a little sell off and they haven't come back in. So that's kind of a little bit of a yellow light, too. You know, you know who you need to get on next on the face, Dale? Who? Fed's cat plan have a little chat to him about his uh, positions. Yeah, I'd like to talk to him. I'm actually uh, trying to schedule a guy who's on Twitter who uh, is with the St. Louis Fed and then just uh, sick uh, Steve Volge on him. Uh, <laughs> so I, I'm going to, Steve, if you're here. Boy, I'm, I'm Okay, I'm, I'm trying to get this guy <laughs> from the St. Louis Fed to come in. And yeah, uh, these people I, don't really want to answer questions and that's well, why if you notice in press conferences they don't really get asked uh real questions or the tough questions and when they do they just give an answer that's irrelevant to what was asked and they move uh, they move on well anyway I, I i thought i'd throw you a piece of raw meat no, sure. uh, and see what you you could chew the guy up uh <laughs> seems like a nice guy but uh, i'll let you know and uh, I, I'd like you involved in that uh, interview. It'd be uh, interesting to see you take on a Fed guy. So um, just thought I'd let you know you have something to look forward to. 
(laughs) (laughs) All right. Blake, how are you? And Stell, how are you guys doing today? Kind of quiet. Good morning. Good good. morning, Stell. Good morning. What's up? Good morning, Blake. How are you? Good. Uh, So uh, I know you you always see stuff, Blake. Uh, I I think a lot of key levels were, were, were tested last night okay lots of them yeah lots all right okay so uh still uh what uh, we'll let blake uh, take over the screen uh unless you wanted to uh anything to report that uh, you saw overseas overnight worth, um, yeah anything worth no, mentioning I mean, the the main thing seems to be cryptos uh Oh yeah, that, uh, last couple of days, and uh, it's funny because the, you know we talked about El Salvador adopting Bitcoin as legal tender, yeah. and and you know they all the uh, crypto fans were rejoicing, and the move we've seen <laughs> has been well very different to what I would have expected. I actually don't know why we sold off that hard. If anybody does know, let me know. But um, um, it, it remains, they remain very heavy. And uh, obviously it's a correction in an uptrend. I mean, in, in the grand scheme of things, but still yeah. it's not what I expected. But um, apart from that, it's been, uh, you know, after yesterday's uh, moves and, and metals got smashed quite a bit, but, uh, you know, we're kind of we're kind of uh, returning to a, a quiet session today and uh, metals are trying to claw back some of the losses. And, you know, the dollar is still, is, the dollar is still looking Pretty pretty good. Uh, it is. Uh, it's trying. It's trying to rally. It's. Um, uh, it's not convincing yet. But um, as I've said so many times, I think yields are the key for everything, for stocks, for the dollar, for yen, for everything basically. And um, as long as yields are not breaking out convincingly, um, I don't think. Uh, I don't think we're going to see anything uh, materially different to what we've had over the past weeks. Okay. Blake, I remember you saying that uh, Bitcoin was ready for a correction at 52,000. You know, you know, it was interesting actually going, going back to Bitcoin, there's a lot of um, very, very bullish uh, FinTwit people uh, yesterday before, yesterday and the day before, uh, before the move lower. Um, I, we had one of the guys pump, 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 uh, I can't. I can't pronounce his last Pompliano. name. Pompliano. Pompliano. That's it. Uh, he. He was. He was. You know. He made some some comment on Twitter about it being up four hundred percent this year, and then um, there's a another guy uh, who's got you know hundreds of thousands of followers too. Uh, he, he's he's a mostly a stock market and currency guy, and he's kind of turned more crypto. Um, bull than anything he 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 made some br- really bullish tweets uh just before the move lower and um you know the the i think everybody's getting pretty comfortable with with the move above 50,000 then um you know to see a, a 20 some odd percent correction no matter what you're trading um you know that's it's got to hurt a little bit and so you know you t- when when we when we noticed bitcoin uh yesterday here's here's your update on forex analytics we were just basically at horizontal support, and um, uh, this is 21 hours ago. Huge horizontal support at the 43.30 level, uh, being tested. Watch for a bounce, and you know, obviously, we bounced really aggressively from there. But man, you know, that's I think that puts a little bit of the bulls on notice right now with with the crypto um, markets. I, I, I think one of the longer thing or longer term, excuse me, structures that you got to look at, look at with Bitcoin and, you know, any, any of the other cryptos is we are making lower highs as of right now. So that's, um, you know, a bit of a shift in the trend. I'm not necessarily bearish cryptos, but, you know, this is this is a kind of a warning, I think, to everybody that the everything rally is winding down here and and that's that's one of the things that we've talked about especially on the 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 private forex analytics webinars like the everything rally you know you're seeing everything from you know yen weakness you know euro yens you know bouncing aggressively the aussie yens bounced you know aggressively um stocks are at all-time highs you know just just the normal just all all 
all boats are being lifted. Along but, the world. Yeah. I mean, the long get long everything, sell dollars, whatever it is, you know, just just you know, get long every asset you can. And we're starting to see, you know, one by one, some of these assets are 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 showing some signs of fatigue. And I think cryptos are another just another asset class that are showing a little bit of fatigue. But, you know, when, when you get up or like for me, you know, in North American trade, I get up in the morning and I look around. I actually think last night was a very active night. I think last night, a lot of key levels were, were tested and hit and rejected. So let's talk a little bit about just some of the majors here. Um, if, if, you know, if you're part of the Forex analytics community, you, you, you you have been listening to the, webinars, the private webinars that we, we've talked between the euro is going to trade between 118 and 119 ahead of the ECB. We tested the lower end of the range, uh, which is basically the 38% retracement, you know, 118 level. I, I I did expect us tomorrow to be sitting right here. If you listen to yesterday's, you know, daily roundup um, recording, you know, I thought we would test 118 and then bounce back to 118.50. And then we're going to figure out you know, where we're going to go following the ECB, you know, I think that's going to be pretty telling, um, you know, the ECB, I, I think is going to be relatively hawkish, believe it or not. I think that they're going to kind of pave the way for, um, for, for, you know, the ECB to actually start tapering in the future, whether or not they do and they follow through with it is, is another thing. But I think that, you know, tomorrow's ECB meeting might be a little bit more hawkish than the market expects. Um, you know, you, you go to the Aussie, the Aussie is, you know, come, come off. And, and actually the resistance in the Aussie overnight, the, which was key. I was, I was sitting there at my son's soccer practice and we were trading above 74 cents. And I'm like, man, if we could just squeeze up to 74.10, I'm going to be, I, you know, I have some sell orders between 74.10 and 74.15. We didn't quite make it there, but um, as as we noted in the um, the overnight session in the Aussie, and again, this is if you know if you're a Forex Analytics subscriber, the um, uh, right here end of day analysis look for sellers above the seventy four cent level overnight. You know that was last night, and um, we basically probed probed above seventy four cents and then slipped you know, 50 pips, that's a pretty big move for the Aussie dollar. And um, you have to also imagine that now we're going to find some buyers as we as we near the 38% retracement. But I think the key and one of the things that actually really has to be noted here is the S&P at the, um, well, actually, there's two things. The S&P here at 4,500, which again, you know, if, if you Look at Forex Analytics, the um, the 4,500 level, 4,500 level support may come into view in Asia, Asian trade. Well, you know, we slipped yeah. 4,500 and bounced like a bat out of hell. And when we did that, everything turned. Uh, now, I was sleeping when that happened. But the reason why that's so important now is that you once now that you're going into North America, we know what's key. This 4,500 level is key. And, and, and I wanted to say one last thing. Is look at the DAX. The DAX basically yeah. hit. Wow. Yeah, it hit wedge support and then bounced pretty aggressively yeah. too. Now, the DAX is coming off right now, uh, the last 30 minutes, but which is kind of impressive actually if you think about it. But um, the DAX had bounced pretty aggressively from that, from that uh, key level support. It's, it's wedge support. All right. So I, yeah, you we're know, on the when verge I, when I here, get up, Blake, we're on the I'm verge sorry? of a few. It looks like we're finally maybe <laughs> on the verge of, uh, some, well, uh, you know, you know, I, some... I, I don't want to get excited about it, but I, yeah, I, I, I know where, you know, the thing about trading is, you know, where the break points are in the market. Right. And we know where they're all at. I mean, you know, S&P is a 4,500, you know, DAX at, 15,600, you know, the, the, the Euro dollar support at 118, you know, I mean, the Aussie, you know, resistance at 74%, you, and, and just as Ryan said a little bit earlier, you know, where the levels are. So, yeah. you know, 
the the market's forging these levels in the market. We know where the the break points are going to be. So I think we need to obviously we have the Bank of Canada today, and 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 by the way, the dollar Canadian. I mean, this is perfect. I, I wasn't a, I yeah, wasn't around, but that. Yeah. yeah, we ripped up to one twenty seven key resistance that these these held. And now, you know, ahead of the Bank of Canada, that's it. You know, we break if, if the Bank of Canada is a little bit more dovish, which, by the way, everybody's expecting, you know, nothing, nothing to happen here for the Bank of Canada. But let's say they're a little bit dove, more dovish. They're, they're worried about COVID and, you know, it doesn't seem like they're going to taper anymore uh, or they put everything on pause. You know, we could rip past 127 here. You know, so, but we know where the break point is. And that's the good news is, is if we break through 127, then we know that, you know, we probably have a good 50 to 70 pip rally uh, ahead of us. And that's, hey, if if you know you're getting into a trade and you know we're a good, uh, a, an easy way or an easier way to make, you know, 30, 40, 50 pips, that's, that's all you need, right? Yep. You just wait Every, for that trade. Yeah. So a, anyway, just if, I think some pretty key levels got tested overnight. And that's why you want to get up and I go, oh, you know, it's kind of so you got to go back and look at price action when you get up. I mean, that's the first thing that I do is I have to look at everything, what happened everywhere. And, and I don't catch everything, obviously. But, um, you know, finding some of these key levels are, or, 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 or developments overnight are, are really important. So uh, any, anyway, Ryan, did you, Ryan Stelios, Steve, did you guys see anything else that I, I might've missed? I, I know you guys are up when I'm not around. So these are just some of the observations that I noticed. <clears throat> you could have been a detective. That's right. You yeah. notice everything. <laughs> no it's not that but it's it's it, it but it's important you know again as the traders the, these little nuances are you know the the difference between oh shoot i missed that move and and being able to catch the move you know knowing where right. where, where where these things are are, are taking place so yeah you're spot on you're spot on blake you know i i joked when i got back from holiday um you know i Euro dollar was at 118 when I left and it was 118 when I got back. And yeah, that's, that's great. But what I spent the, the next few days doing is find out what happened in between, you know, what happened at, yeah. when it broke 1700, you know, before going away, I would have been a buyer at 1700 because there was option barriers down there. It was solid support previous to that. So likely it is, I would have done some money on it if, if I had my stop, uh, you know, around the 80 level, but you've got to learn. And it's the same intraday. You're coming in the morning the price may be exactly where you left it the night before, but what's happened in between? Have we broken any levels? Have we touched any levels? You know, what has it done with those levels? And as you say, you either get levels that then get confirmed, like 127 in 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 the loony, or you get a break and and you think, well, okay, now that 127 level is is going to be support perhaps. Um, and that's how you assess it. Every day is a learning process, as we know. Totally, a hundred percent agree. So, um, and 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 it's just. Really, really important that, um, I, and I, and I think that, you know, as, as traders, you, you just gotta, you just have to realize that when, when, when like a level that you've been watching, when it breaks, look for, you know, rather than just jumping in, like uh, here, here's, here's a good example. Um, yesterday I, I, I tweeted and I, I haven't been tweeting much recently just because, you know, obviously you, you know, we're in a one-way market in the S and P. So it's like, you know, all these little nuances are shared amongst the Forex analytics community. I don't need to share, you know, big deals in the, in the FX market um, because we just don't, there's nothing really happening at the moment, but um, uh, the U S dollar Norwegian Krona, I, I, I put a tweet out yesterday that we got a big double top, but it's not going, it's not, you know, it hasn't been playing out lower. And I said, you know, if we get above uh, eight, uh, 873, it could be, you know, it could turn the other way. And what happened last night is we actually rallied to 873 and, you know, point, you know, 8.73 and just a, a couple other pips. And then it slipped again, but it just showed you how important that 873 level is. And that's why when we get to these, 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 you know, resistance or support levels, you got to look for sustained moves. Like if we get a sustained break above 875 now in the dollar, in the US dollar Norwegian Krona, this thing is now, you know, you just wait for it to sit up here for more than, you know, 
30 or 40 minutes. And, uh, you know, we'll trade, we'll trade up pretty aggressively. That would be my assumption. So now we, you know, we, we already knew that that's where our break point is. And now it's very clear where it's at. So again, you know, knowing where they're at and looking for those sustained breaks, I think is going to be really critical for you guys, uh, and your success moving forward. But, uh, anyway, I know, I know that it's, it's, it's time for, uh, for Dale to bring in Kirk Spano. I, he's one of your guests that I've heard here before. Yes. So um, <clears throat> I want to say, uh, Stelio, Steve, uh, Ryan, thanks for joining in today. And, um, and I, and, thank and, and thank, yeah, and thank you guys for, for listening in today. And, uh, we're going to see all the, uh, Forex analytics subscribers on the morning edge in about 45 minutes. And then we're going to go through all the majors and, um, uh, build out our, uh, bias chart. So we'll see you there. Cheers, guys. Thank see you ya. guys. Good, good hunting today, Ryan, Blake, Steve, Sell. Cheers, mate. The best Thank team you, on the net. Thanks, Dale. The dream, the dream team. Okay, so Kirk, I want to welcome you back. I'm trying to make Kirk a uh, panelist. It's not allowing me for some. There we go. Okay. Welcome, Kirk. Welcome back, buddy. Waiting for you to unmute. Unmute, unmute. There you are. Uh, <laughs> look at your black lab. Yep. Is that yours? I'm uh, rearranging your... my office right now, so I, I don't have a camera set up. Okay. Do you uh, are you using a laptop? You want to show any charts or anything? Well, I do. So I will share my screen. Okay. I think that just worked. Yeah. Peak oil plateau. There you go. Wow. Uh, we'll fall by 2030. Okay, um, so let's talk about this. Uh, so is that EV? Uh, oil things. demand will fall because we're all going to be driving electric vehicles? Uh, we're going to see oil demand fall for these two key reasons. Uh, there are many key reasons for why the oil demand will fall, but ultimately the oil price will fall. Um, the EVs. If you take a look at all the mandates around the world, you yeah. have eight, 18 governments now, major governments, not little countries, but big countries that are on the pathway to eliminating uh, ICE vehicle sales anywhere from 2025 to 2035. I think in the United States, it'll probably be 2035. Uh, but Europe just got very aggressive over the summer uh, you're already seeing it from China and India, and that's on top of the incredible efficiency uh, that we're seeing with EVs. But it's not just the EVs, although that's the one that gets headlines. The utility systems uh, outside of India and China are already bringing down their fossil fuel use, uh, in particular coal, but also oil. And okay. you're starting to see petrochemicals get substitutes for feedstocks. And I think that that is going to be something that almost nobody sees coming. Okay, so uh, explain that. Uh, there's oil in current feedstocks? Right, you, you know, plastics, petroleum, you know, oh. petrochemicals. Okay. Um, the I don't know. I, I thought of agriculture when I heard uh, feedstocks. Yes. But okay. That, okay, right. Okay, so, and that's not what you mean, right? No, 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 no. But agriculture is is... Part of that game actually okay. uh, there's companies out there now that can pull the carbon uh, the methane and the co2 out of dairy farms and water treatment plants right um, power plants and they can turn that into plastic energy and well, also it, it, uh energy i think they have, don't they have uh a lot of these uh farms uh, chicken farms and everything they produce all this waste that kicks out methane and there are um there are, oh, i forgot what they're called but it's almost like a big uh, cauldron that uh, converts this stuff to energy if they if you could have storage that you could convert the waste into energy have you heard yes. of those things huh yeah, there's a company in California that I'm invested in called Amitas, uh, A-E-M-I-T-A-S, and uh, they have a big jump on carbon capture and uh, sequestration 
and uh, renewable energies in California, a big first mover advantage. Uh, and what they're doing is, you know, the, the simplistic way of putting it is what you just did. They, they get a big pile of poop and they turn it yeah. into energy and, 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 they can, and they can farm it off to other companies or the private company in California that can turn it into plastic. Okay. Yeah. Or even sell back the energy to utilities. Yeah. I, this is the new wave. Do you think there's going to be a lot of, uh, well, first of all, Kirk, do you think we're going to get an infrastructure bill? to support some of the things that you're saying here um, uh, is would things like this be included in the 1.7 trillion or is it more about the other one which is i believe more about social infrastructure um right what do you so, see coming in that first bipartisan bill that um is going to support your narrative well so here's the problem with the current legislation is it's a little bit light on the clean energy stuff as far as I think it should go, but it's more than we've ever done. And presuming that uh, Joe Manchin doesn't hold up the bills um, because there's, a, <laughs> there's actually another short uh, idea there, um, but presuming these bills get done roughly as we've heard about them, uh, the movement towards clean energy will actually come through the regulatory process, not so much through taxation. And, you know, it is accelerating. Is it accelerating as much as the Super Bowls on clean energy want it to? No. Is it, uh, is oil going to all of a sudden be the, the fuel that we use until 2050? No. You know, there, there's always that in-between thing. And I think these bills are in-between and I'm not positive uh, that they get passed in a way that is going to supercharge any of this because okay. Manchin is very pro, you know, fossil fuel. So, so we'll see. But it is a step in that direction, but it's not the supercharge event that people on the left want it to be. Okay. What do you have for us after this slide? So, is this is this it? Yeah, I just I, oh. I kind of go through the history uh, oh. of this in, in the in, in the presentation, and and I have this available. Um, I, I should edit it one more time, but I have a whole presentation available. These are things that I said way back in 2014. Okay. And a lot wow. of these things have happened. Um, you know, in the parentheses, I I put some of the changes. You know, I was at CES a year ago year and a half ago, and it became apparent to me that hydrogen was going to have a role in energy storage and, and heavy-duty vehicles. Um, the demographically-based slow-growth forever thesis that you're starting to hear play out in the news again about growth slowing down from the rebound, all these things are, are happening. And I think that for the oil trader, um, I really actually think that the price of oil is going to be relatively range bound for several years. And, and the thing that you're going to see happen is eventually the markets and the governments, and I think the government's already realized, and I think OPEC already realizes that the oil age is, you know, into that second or third inning of the end of the oil age. And as they get to the middle innings of the end of the oil age, countries that rely on oil production are going to produce more oil, right? Because they need to get it to market. So that's going to create an event for U.S. oil companies that is not going to be very positive. You're going to eventually get that last wave of oil company bankruptcies. And I think that there's a trade coming three, four, five years out, right? But shorter term, uh, you know, as you're showing on your chart there, uh, you could get, you know, a wavy period in oil. Uh, I don't know if you see, you know, that 45, 42, 50 price in the short term, but you could because the economy is just not growing uh, as fast as people want it to, right? We, we saw this rebound. And the rebound is kind of tailing off. 
And a lot of the hopium on oil was based on the rebound being very, very sustainable. Okay, so uh, you have a take on the overall market, Kirk? I mean, you know, 45.40 it's, uh, uh, has been the recent high. Um, do you think this market is set up for any kind of uh, disappointment? I mean, this is these are the only kind of breaks we get, very orderly, orderly. Um, do you have a line in the sand for where you wouldn't want to have uh, stock exposure? So I have been cutting back on my S&P 500 exposure forever. And I, I've been getting involved with some of the meme stocks, uh, some of the cryptocurrencies, you know, Shooter, uh, your buddy, has been helping me out there. Yeah. And I think that the S&P 500, there's a very important stat to remember. 70% of the cash, 75% right in there, of the cash on corporate American balance sheets are on the NASDAQ 100 companies, which are all in the S&P 500. So you essentially have 100 companies that have three quarters of the cash and the other 400 companies, the last quarter of the cash. So what does that say about about a quarter of the companies on the S&P 500? They're, they're, they're relatively junk companies, a lot of zombies, and I think that you can selectively short the heck out of the no growth companies on the S&P 500 because most of them don't have good balance sheets to boot. So you've got 100 to 200 stocks on the S&P 500 that I think, I mean, are just really easy shorts. And I'll show you my S&P 500 chart in a second here i'll pull it up for you okay you you have to take the screen i'm going to stop sharing and because uh, i was showing uh, some things so i have a, a pretty big here you go so this is my s p 500 chart okay. and i've talked for a long time about how that period 2015-16 that flat two-year period choppy two-year period was kind of the baseline for the market. Mm -hmm. And because of low interest rates and QE, the channel for the stock market has risen to this green one. It, you know, it should be down here, but it's not. And if interest rates are low forever, maybe then the higher channel is permanent, right? But I point this out to millennials. And I say, look, with the exception of dividends, you know, 2%, coupon, there is a very long period here, about 13 years Upside before the S&P 500 broke out again, right? Mm -hmm. I think the next decade could be a lot like that. So I think there's a little bit of cigar puff left. I don't know that we really get up to 500 here in the short term, but I think you can see a zigzag motion filling out here for the decade. And my big thesis for the 2020s is that the bifurcation in the quality of the S&P 500 is going to keep that index bouncing around. And, it, and each time it'll set a little higher high, you know, just because that's the headline and we have to have it. But I think that you're going to see a pretty choppy period. Um, I think that the S&P 500 could get down to around 350. I think it's close to its top point. But I think that the Reddit army, the apes, the retards, that's what they call themselves, are probably right. And I think, um, you know, the money printer goes burr at some point. So, you know, wherever we end in here, we come down to around here. And if there's an Armageddon scenario, it could go lower. Uh, I, I just think you see something along these lines uh, over the next decade. And it's going to be driven by those zombie companies eventually getting killed. And there's going to be a lot of them getting killed in the middle of the decade uh, because the Federal Reserve facilitated their debt get extended. So when their debt is really due, and it was going to be due in 2020, 21, 22, you know, now it's due in 24, 25, 26, you know, 
the correction that I expected last year, even before coronavirus, I think was going to happen either way. And now we've just pulled the timeline back four or five, six years by refinancing everybody's corporate debt. Uh, but the whole slow growth forever thesis that I've been talking about in Market Watch since 2012 is look, demographics dictate uh, the, the pace of the economy. And we just aren't going to see a lot of growth. That's one of the things I mentioned with the oil. There, there just isn't a lot of growth. There's a lot of refurbishing of the economy, but the post-World War II and then baby boomer driven growth periods and then the emerging market, particularly uh, China, you know, getting people into the middle class, those things are all gone. So the only way to have a lot of growth is rebuild the world and make it sustainable. Uh, you know, maybe that's just the excuse. Maybe none of the clean energy and climate change stuff is real. Uh, you know, I don't believe that. But, you know, even if it weren't, the governments need a way to create growth. And maybe that's what they're using. Who knows? Okay. But, uh, do, do you think that the government um, and this current administration uh, is going to uh, upset the apple car in big tech with uh, antitrust regulations, et cetera. Is that an overhang for the best performing group um, as of late, the FANG and MAGA stocks? I think you're going to get a rerun of what we had, or whatever it was, six or seven years ago when they got called to Congress. You know, everybody got their sound bites and got their. Yeah, their PR moment, and, but and you know, happens. this would be slap on the wrist, slap on the wrist. Okay, you know, maybe, maybe Instagram I'm... has to get spun out of Facebook. So, what? Uh, okay, how about what China's doing? Uh, the draconian measures they're taking with uh, tech stocks, you know, uh, after 2008, they were not um, as weak as the rest of the world, they didn't suffer from the Great Recession as much as we did, and they were actually uh, were attributed as the engine of growth that helped, besides central banks, help pull us out of it. Um, do you think they could, uh, the Chinese could, uh, which are having some difficulties, uh, almost um, self-inflicted, uh, that they could drag us down? So I've got a lot to say about China. So we probably need a, a, an afternoon and do a long form. But okay. um, I think that, well, let's put it this way. For two years, I've been telling people to sell their commie stocks. And the reason I say it is because I just, just I've always thought that G was untrustworthy when it came to um, protections of your property rights and your capital. And this decline in the emerging markets, internet and e-commerce ETF from here to here was yeah. part a blow off, but it was mainly the Chinese stocks. And we've gotten a rally and weirdly it hit right on my 618 line. Um, Cause that never happens. <laughs> it probably come back down here again. And then the question is, is does it head all the way down here? Um, I think that China is at risk of, decelerating their entire economy because yeah. I think that they overestimate their power um, to control everything. To, uh, yeah. I, I just, I just don't think that they realize that not everybody's going to cooperate, you know? Right. So uh, the whole export driven economy is going to be difficult for them to transition away from. And I think that they don't have the technology on the semiconductor side. I think that Taiwan is the biggest flashpoint potentially on the planet. Yeah. Um, I think that the Chinese situation is dangerous. I have things that I've been writing a, a novel about uh, that have to do with how coronavirus really happened. So, you know, I, I don't have a lot of positive things to say about the Chinese government. Um, and I think that like people all over the world, propaganda works. We see it in this country. We see it in Europe. We see it everywhere. Propaganda has worked for a long time. And from a okay. psychological standpoint, will continue to work. 
because we like to blame things on foreigners. And it doesn't matter if we're American or Chinese or European, we like to blame it on the foreigners. Um, so I, I am afraid of the economic impacts that China could have on the rest of the world if they decelerate and destabilize. Okay. <clears throat> you know, you also keep an eye on another region. Um, we used to talk about Iran a lot, and they have a new president, and um, Israel has a new prime minister, and the U.S. has a new president. Um, what kind of mix uh, do you expect anything? What do you expect out of the region now, especially with Iran and what's happened with our withdrawal from Afghanistan, it you know, kind of reminded me of when the Soviet Union pulled out, and it wasn't much longer after that before they had major problems and dissolved. Um, what what's your feel on what's happening out there? So, about fifteen or sixteen years ago, it started to become apparent to me that the reason we got rid of Saddam Hussein was so that there was no longer a buffer between Iran and Saudi Arabia and that they would have to deal with each other. And that facilitated arms deals for us under I multiple see. presidents. And now what you're seeing, and, and I've long thought there'd be a, a war there by now, um, you know, more than the typical war, the proxy wars, I, I thought there'd be a bigger blow up. And what became apparent to me during the Trump administration, and maybe this would have been the same under a Hillary administration, I don't know. Uh, but I don't think there's a lot of stomach for fighting in the Middle East anymore. Yeah, I think pulling out of Afghanistan was part of that. Right. Um, and it's because we don't really need them anymore. Right, our imports of, of OPEC oil are way, way down. And I think that we are leaving that part of the world to itself to settle itself out. I think that the great powers, have, you know, and maybe China is going to take a shot, but I think that the great powers realize that these are fires that outsiders can't put out, and maybe even the people who live there can't put out. So a lot of it revolved around oil for decades and decades. And now that we're at the end of the oil age or starting the end of the oil age, second inning, whatever it is, uh, I think you're going to see more and more of the U.S. pulling out of the region. And I say that with a sister-in-law that's in Iraq right now um, on the Syrian border. I believe that you're going to see an attempt made by Iran to integrate into the world because their view on converting everybody to Islam is that they can do it without having to do it forcibly, right? That we'll all just adopt it. And, you know, I, I, I don't think that's true, but I think that you're going to get a nuclear deal. I think that you're going to see more and more pressure on the major countries in the region to support the region. I think pulling out of Afghanistan is part of putting pressure on Iran because now they have to deal with that on their border. You know, there, there's, there's been a concerted effort since 9-11, and I'll, I, I'm writing about this right now. You know, one of the things, and if you haven't watched the Apple special on it, it's worth taking the free trial to Apple TV to watch this special on 9-11, is since 9-11, the United States made the concerted effort to start using less oil from the region and to go and kick some ass and and then proceed to withdraw which is what you're seeing right now okay so we have fewer troops in the middle east uh i think afghanistan pulling out of afghanistan was later than it should have been uh, but i think it all is part of a long game that people like dick cheney uh, believed in and we are seeing the end of the long game of the united states in the middle east right now and that might cause instability. It might not. Probably will. And, and if you get that war, that'll be your spike in the price of oil. Uh, if not, now you have China in the region. Uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia have to deal with each other. Iraq is the, you know, the rope in the middle of the tug of war game. 
Um, Syria and Afghanistan are, you know, I think uh, Trump probably described those relatively appropriately uh, because they've been bombed into oblivion. Okay, Kurt. You know, I, I, I think that you're going to see a lot of uh, change there, and it might not be for the good. Okay, so uh, uh, we should probably keep an eye on the flashpoint in uh, the South China Sea and Taiwan. I guess there's a major military exercises there the middle of the month. Uh, I think that we place a lot of subs there, and we're doing uh, joint exercises with Taiwan, and because of that, China's doing something prior. So you think that's the new flashpoint in the world. It's not new, but the one to pay attention to. Yeah, you know, I, I think the Middle East is part of the game there as well. You know, it's part of soaking up resources from our enemies. But I think Taiwan is the one place where if Chi oversteps, that is the one place where I could see a conflict um, that evolves past the proxy war. And there's not a lot of places on the planet where you can say, yeah, you know, our guys will mess around with their guys, but pretty much we, we leave each other alone. I think Taiwan is a place where... There are no think, proxies for Taiwan. There are not, right. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's either they land on the beach or they don't. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, it's... Well, usually it's, uh, isn't it first um, uh, terrible financial conditions before something like that happens? Um, and isn't, you know, kind of what we're seeing? Um, in China is that, uh, you know, they have half the above ground food stock, grain stock. They're preparing for some type of famine. Um, <clears throat> just uh, China's the one to look for. And, and uh, uh, Biden's kind of a hawk when it comes to China and Russia. So, uh, you know, everyone thinks he elected a Democrat and they're, you know, uh, they're going to be for peace, but he's kind of a hawk. Where's the best place for people to follow your writings? You're a great thinker, Kirk. I always like listening to you uh, every time you've been on here. And uh, I know you do a lot of writing. You're, uh, you know, right. prolific uh, with uh, your thoughts and uh, you're a long-term thinker. So here, Fundamental Trends is Fundamental uh, trends. Kirk's one. Okay. And I have a free library card here, so you can get all the oh. macro and reports and you know usually about a piece per week and then also over at seeking alpha you know hey one thing i will tell you about taiwan because you brought up that biden was, is potentially a hawk you know i did not like president trump and i think everybody who listens to me knows that however i'm i'm not in love with joe biden either um and in fact uh i know you i, I just part of, you know what i mean yeah yeah, you know, and, and I put that out there just so people don't think I'm super far in either direction. I, you know, I'm a centrist. I've always said if you can't reach the middle, you probably aren't helping. I think that ultimately, unless there's mistakes made, I think China's going to end up getting um, some sort of a deal on Taiwan, maybe extending the, um, the, the current arrangement. I don't think the United States ultimately has a reason to protect Taiwan. Um, I think we have a reason to <clears throat> threaten to and make yeah. sure that China doesn't go in there and completely turn it over, So uh, take it over. So I think there will be a deal at some point. And I think the thing that you can watch to really understand that is in Intel. Hong Kong, what they did no, with Intel Hong Kong? And, in, no, no, no. I mean, Hong Kong is attached to China, so you always yeah. knew they were going in there. Taiwan's okay. out in the water. It's an island, right? Yeah. But you can tell that we are um, preparing them arms. And, well, just well, but and that's fine. We can sell them weapons. We make money on that, and they can, you know, it, it's part of the negotiation, right? Try to negotiate from strength. Just like we started using our own oil with fracking to to extract ourselves from the Middle East as we transitioned away from oil altogether. Our semiconductor industry is moving back home and Intel is throwing $130 billion into developing a European and American fab system and supply chains. Taiwan Semiconductor is building in Arizona. Right. Why do you think those things are happening? Yeah. It's because we know 
<clears throat> that the capacity in Taiwan is probably going to go to China at some point. Got it. So oh. you negotiate that and you say, okay, how do we avoid a war in Taiwan? And then we both get our semiconductors because semiconductors go on, are, are like oil was. Right. right. Oil was the most yeah. important thing in the world until recently. And now semiconductors are the most important thing in the world. And who knows what's going to be the most important thing in 20 or 30 years. But that's what I see coming with Taiwan. I think that mistakes when I, you're I disagree. At the high levels I, that happen, though. I think your black lab is uh, the most important thing in the world to you. Yeah, she she's uh, 14 in November. Oh, wow, yeah, okay. That, that picture up there, I took her to New York uh, to Times Square, and I let her off the leash, and she didn't go nowhere. She just sat down and looked around. Yeah, well, it's been great talking to you, Kirk, and I, I do encourage people that are listening to us live or watch a video later to uh, just go and check out uh, Kirk's readings and some of his content, and uh, if you like long-term thinking with potentially some short-term ideas, here's where you go. So thank you, my trading warrior brother, for yeah, thanks hanging a lot, out Dale. with us I'd today. love to get you on my program here real soon. I know we've been talking about it. Okay. We'll do it. We'll do it, buddy. All right. You take care. All right. So that's a wrap. Uh, uh, Anthony saying thank you. Uh, and uh, we enjoyed it. And everyone, uh, have a have a good day. Good good hunting. Be careful. I think ECB tomorrow and we'll see everyone for that event. Remember, don't just count your pips, count your blessings and you could join the team in 14 minutes for the morning edge. Adios. Thank you, Kirk. Thank you.